Well, greetings, uh, bring you greetings from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. It's such a privilege um, and an honor to be here today and to be with such a prestigious uh, lineup of speakers. Um, I'm just delighted to be part of this conversation. I appreciate, uh, thank you, Craig, uh, for this invitation and the Maxwell Institute. Um, so apparently I'm going to be a good Protestant iconoclast and not have a PowerPoint presentation. So. Um, not why, but we are here today talking about the reformation of the church during the 16th century because uh, 500 years ago, Luther um, uh, posted something that went unexpectedly viral in Wittenberg, Germany, and Luther's post, the 95 Theses, began to reach the multitudes um, when it was translated into German or the common person's language called the vernacular and was aided by the power of the printing press and was embraced by th those in the pop uh, sorry there's something by those in the populace attuned to its grievances and open to re reorientation in that momentous day on October 31st set in motion the transformation of the church in the West and around the world and with considerable impact upon Western politics and culture and society and more. So it is definitely an event worth exploring. It is said that within five years of the 95 Theses, Luther's, uh, Luther was Europe's most published author ever. And yet nothing was more, more important to Luther than publishing the Bible in the common language of the people, the German Bible. And for that reason and more, the story of the Reformation and of Martin Luther's contribution to the reform of the church cannot be understood apart from the Bible. The Bible dominated his thinking, it dominated his writing, his publishing, his lecturing, his preaching, and even his free hands. Eric Griech's delightful book, The Wit of Martin Luther, tells the story of two students coming across a knight at the Bear Inn in Jena. He was, the knight was wearing breeches, a doublet, and a red hat. They joined him for a drink and discussed the news at Wittenberg and their desire to meet the professor who began the reform movement there. And at first they did not know his true identity, but then they noticed something strange. This knight was encouraging them to study biblical languages. That was a strange conversation to have with a knight in a tavern. And they noticed that he was carrying a sword in one hand, as a knight should, but uh, did a double take when they saw him carrying a Hebrew psalter in the other. The story perhaps resonates with the New Testament account of the walk to Emmaus, uh, when the resurrected Jesus is explaining scripture to two men he encounters on the road, and they do not recognize him until he breaks bread and their eyes are open. So similarly, the strangeness of seeing a knight with a book of the Bible in his hand open their eyes to his true identity. This, this encounter illustrates, I think, that even in disguise, Luther could not be parted from scripture. So effectively did he become associated with the Bible in the minds and perceptions of others that according to scholar Bob Scribner, Two-thirds of all the portraits and illustrations of Luther in the 16th century depicted a Bible in his hands. Luther in his time and in the images of his time carried a Bible in his hands. And even in our time today, so I'm sure someone's already mentioned this, but the, you know, for the 500th anniversary, the toy company Playmobil released a figurine called Little Luther. Has anybody heard about this? Yeah? Okay, right? Anybody able to buy one? They're very hard to get. Um, and, uh, you know, Little Luther is holding a Bible in his hands. Uh, the unprecedented 34,000 figurines were sold out in less than 72 hours. It was the fastest selling figure of all time, Playmobil figure of all time. And if you read any of the articles, they're really, they're really pretty, pretty fun. Um, Luther, Luther's toy is called The Answer to Playmobil's Prayers. <laughs> and uh, the reformer of the toy industry. <laughs> the German company, <laughs> it's also said, was reportedly baffled by the success of Little L Luther. <laughs> So in these ways and more, uh, Luther's place in history is conveyed 
by his contribution to the church in terms of the Bible. And yet this depiction was not just about recounting the fact that he did translate the Bible into German, um, but it also represents how he stressed in every possible way that scripture held primacy of place in the Christian life. In 1521, Luther proclaimed scripture's primacy over all things Quite defiantly, during the momentous meeting with Charles V at the Diet of Worms, there he declared that he must be convinced by the testimony of Holy Scripture to revoke his writings. And he went on to claim that his conviction and indeed his very foundation rested on the testimony of Holy Scripture. Of course, we all know his dramatic words, here I stand, I can do no other. But I think really uh, the we can see in his other words, this driving motivation behind his obstinacy is made better known in his words, my conscience is captive to the word of God. In a time when medieval scholasticism tended to describe the sacraments of baptism and penance as planks that believers used to protect against shipwreck, on that day, Luther clung to the plank of scripture for dear life in the face of ex of not only excommunication, but imperial ban and the loss of life. Now, as we know, Luther's life was preserved. He was kidnapped of Wartburg Castle, according to the plan of Frederick of Saxony, and there he set to work on questionably his most important contribution, a translation of the New Testament into German. This was a tax that he took on of his own volition with the aid of Renaissance humanist Desiderius Erasmus, his Greek New Testament, the second edition, and with the assistance of his colleague and Greek language expert, Philip Melanchthon. And after 11 weeks, the translation was complete. Luther's achievement was a folio that would soon be known anonymously as the September Testament, um, though his authorship was really no mystery to anyone there. And in it contained 21 pages of woodcut images illustrating Revelation, thanks to his friend and artist, Lucas Cranach. And Luther took, uh, he even took theological license and reordered the New Testament canon in a way that prioritized those books that he regarded as theologically strongest in their explanation of the gospel. So for the weekly wage of a journeyman carpenter, Luther's New Testament could be yours. He began working on the Old Testament translation immediately, and 12 years later, he had published his first complete Bible in high German. So how should we commemorate and understand the importance of this achievement? In February 2015, Newsweek.com published an article, again, about the Playmobil, in an effort to explain the significance of Luther, the article offered the following explanation. Luther challenged the authority of the Catholic Pope and translated the Bible from Latin into German for the first time. No, <laughs> that's not accurate. <laughs> but it does re reflect a common and enduring um, misconception. In fact, there were 18 German Bible translations published in Germany by 1518, before Luther's 1522 German New Testament. And so again, how should we commemorate and understand the importance of Luther's contribution to the Bible? The title of my paper emphasizes the advancement of the vernacular Bible, and that's my way of acknowledging a scholarly consensus that has emerged among medieval and Reformation Bible historians regarding access and engagement with the Bible before the Reformation. There's been considerable revision that has been required of a narrative or a paradigm that once claimed no Bibles were available to the layperson before the Protestant Reformation in the common language. And this narrative also said that there was a universal prohibition of lay access to vernacular Bibles before the Protestant Reformation. As it is with everything, the true story is much more complicated than that. 
Um, I appreciate the work of scholar Franz von Leer who qualifies this. He says, although ecclesiastical concerns about heresy thus could raise questions about the validity of vernacular translation and did lead in some cases to injunctions against some translations, there was no universal categorical objection to vernacular Bible translations in the Middle Ages. Van Leer, along with scholars like Andrew Gao and Marguerite Hugliet, have contributed much to a more accurate understanding of the place and the function of the Bible before the Reformation. And this has necessitated a revised understanding of the role and function of the Bible after the Reformation. To scholars like Gao, the idea that the Bible was lacking or barred from the laity before the Reformation is merely Protestant propaganda. And one particular quote by Luther really gets his goat. In the 1539 Wittenberg edition of Luther's German writings, he declared that the Bible lies forgotten in the dust under the bench. For Gal, this defies the reality of the many editions of German Bibles that were available at the time. And in contrast, he argues that it was late medieval popular devotion and encounter with biblical content through the life of the church that actually helped, quote, to create a demand for more complete and accessible versions of the Bible in the period of the Reformation. His perspective offers a helpful reminder that greater nuance and research is still needed as we mark this anniversary year and consider Luther's contribution to the Bible. Now, my archival research is, is focused on uncovering the story of, of French Bibles um, from the Reformation through the Enlightenment. But this research has led me to conclude, even while accepting Gao's views um, in some of these correctives, that the vernacular Bible was still advanced in extraordinary and enduring ways during the Reformation period, beginning with Martin Luther and the reform movement that he began. There is a transformation that happens to the vernacular Bible during the Reformation, and it cannot always be captured by merely um, publication numbers. Translators such as Luther sought greater mastery of the common language in order that the message might be more clear and accurate. Translators sought to root their translations in more authoritative manuscripts, even though we know today that they weren't all that much better. Um, meaning going back to the original languages of Hebrew and Greek for the Old and New Testament in order that the translation could be more accurate and more authoritative. Indeed, with the tools of Renaissance humanism, the vernacular Bible reaches a level of precision arguably not known since Jerome translated the Latin Bible in the fourth century. Of course, the Latin Vulgate had changed considerably by the 16th century. Publication numbers from the period can tell us that this advancement of the vernacular Bible was widely, uh, wildly successful with uh, 450 editions issued by his death in 1546 and at least half a million copies in circulation by that year. And thanks to the printing press, that was actually possible. But what was really driving the advancement of the vernacular Bible? Too often today, I think the theological impetus undergirding, shaping, promoting vernacular Bible projects of the Reformation have been sometimes sidelined or alienated from the social, cultural, and political story. That's perhaps most evident in this quote by Luther in the Wittenberg edition of his German writings. Was Luther really saying that the Bible was forgotten and there were no vernacular Bibles available in Christendom? I can hardly imagine that is correct. Surely there is no reason to wield a book, cat book catalog statistics to combat his remarks as though the discussion is one of numbers for him. The entire approach seems to be missing the point of his criticism, and there is insight to be gained from the larger context of this particular comment. I'd argue that Luther here is not saying that there are no Bibles available, but that scripture has somehow lost pride of place among the authority, the voices of authority within the church. He therefore calls the reader to listen again at the feet of the apostles and the prophets first and foremost, and to not hinder from, from reading scripture directly. For him, scripture holds primacy because no book can improve on what one finds in holy scripture. 
And therefore, he explains that his translation of the Bible into German was intended first and foremost to encourage the study of scripture. Importantly, and in his own words, Gao recognizes that when Luther came on the scene, there was a desire for more complete and accessible versions of the Bible. Let us keep in mind, though, that the study of scripture is not merely some academic enterprise for him, but the encounter with the gospel message, which he defines in his preface to the New Testament as the preaching about Jesus Christ. Thus, it seems worth stressing during this 500th anniversary that the heart of Luther's purpose in advancing a more complete and accessible version of the German Bible was not guided by meeting a commercial demand, but a spiritual need that he saw in the life of the church. After all, he was not just a university professor, but a parish priest as well. Consequently, Luther's Bible project consumed him from the first moments of his imperial ban until the last year of his life because of his motivation not to prop up a sacred book, but from his view to restore a gospel, the gospel message proclaimed there. So, and that Luther will go on to explain that message, and I'll just kind of summarize, but that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is sufficient, and I think that's really the most important word in trying to understand, trying to get a sense of where Protestants are coming from, is to try and uh, emphasize the sufficiency of Christ's death on the cross. That that is what enables right relationship with God. And so the faith in who Christ is and in what he accomplished is the foundation of our relationship with God. Um, for Luther and his followers, scripture taught that it was faith alone and Christ alone and according to the gift of God's grace alone that believers receive redemption to the glory of God alone. This should indicate to us that for Luther and the reformers, the advancement of the gospel message went hand in hand with a material advancement of the vernacular Bible. In some cases, restoring scripture's primacy of place meant literally replacing the sacred objects of the church with the physical body, uh, sorry, with the physical Bible. Consider the story of Wilhelm Rublin. He was a native of Rotenburg and a people's priest in Basel. In 1522, the year after Luther was questioned the deed of Worms, Worms uh, Rublin began to advocate for reform. Rublin was a, he was a powerful preacher who could attract a, a crowd, and he openly, very brashly criticized church hierarchy over such, mass, uh, such matters as church masses for the dead, veneration of the saints, fasting, you name it. And on Palm Sunday, he broke the Lenten fast with two other priests by partaking in a meal of suckling pig. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> this was just a few weeks um, after another food taboo had been broken, namely the famous sausage affair in Zurich, when a group of citizens broke the Lenten fast by eating sausages in the presence of Ulrich Zwingli, no less. So you didn't know food was such a huge part of the Reformation. But Rublin's Reformation zeal did not stop there. Uh, during the feast of Corpus Christi, um, Rublin made a very public and controversial decision to carry a Bible in the procession instead of the expected relic. In explanation of his actions, Rublin famously declared the Bible was a truly holy object and the rest were only dead bones. Such behavior landed Rublin expelled from the city by the bishop that year. Um, and his zeal would not stop, stop there. Um, his story continues in Moravia and with Anabaptist leaders. Rublin's actions and words reflect uh, the motivation of the early Reformation to refocus the church on that which can truly give life. Not dead bones in the, word, in the words of Rublin, but the living word of God. As Luther would write at the end of his preface to the New Testament, it is the words of Christ that give life. This idea that the word of God, that is scripture itself, has been displaced by the, ref by the medieval church was a concern consistently stressed and vocalized throughout the period. And, that, and this meant that this meant the displacement of the gospel message. Similar perceptions are voiced on the reform side of the Protestant Reformation, such as with Heinrich Bullinger, Zwingli's successor um, as the reformer at Zurich. 
He wrote that scripture together with the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Ten Commandments. And actually, um, Bibles would be bound with those pieces. Um, were the only true and holy relics left in the Church of Christ. Interestingly, these dynamics can, I think, be observed as playing out in the vernacular Bibles themselves. And Bible prefaces are useful for gaining a sense of the context for the publication of vernacular Bibles in their time and space during the Reformation. So what I want to do now, do I, I don't know how much time I have. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to move from Wittenberg to Geneva, if that's okay with you. And uh, I want to talk about some examples from Reformation French Bibles um, to illustrate this. And before reaching uh, the biblical text, so think about uh, picking up a Bible. Before you reach the biblical text, the reader of the early modern French Protestant Bible would uh, encounter many pieces of the Bible that would seek to shape your engagement with the text. So this would include uh, the title page and would often promote the legitimacy of its translation with reference to original languages and um, also notable scholars, for example. And you have a table of contents. Um, and basically, it's an opportunity then for the reader to visualize the canon, the church canon itself. There, there are charts often. Um, and uh, one of my personal favorites would be the chart that provides specific dating for the creation of the world until the birth of Christ. So lots of charts with, with information. Um, and I'll analyze, I want to analyze how the prefaces that first appeared in, French, in Geneva's French Bibles, um, uh, the way that um, they teach engagement with scripture for the reader. There are several key reasons why I've, I focus on Geneva's French Bibles. Um, for, for one, I'm taking this approach because many of them tend to find their lineage in Bibles first published in Geneva, and this also includes some Catholic French Bibles. Um, additionally, many French Bibles tended to reference the pastors of Geneva as a, as a proving revision or proving correction of the translation, and I interpret this trend as sort of an authorizing body of French, uh, French Bibles in lieu of a lack of a, a monarch's support. Um, Finally, I'll focus on, um, I want to focus on Geneva Bible prefaces because those that originated in Geneva are most frequently included in French Bibles um, beyond Geneva. And in fact, from the 16th through the 18th century, um, I've been able to track the, the impact of John Calvin's particularly approach in thinking about how you engage with scripture and why you engage with scripture, and, and that is, is found as late as through the 18th century, um, even in some Italian New Testament Bibles as well. To begin, Luther's uh, translation of the German Bible from the original languages set a, a flurry of vernacular Bible translations, and Pierre Robert Olivetin, who was uh, actually John Calvin's cousin, um, was published uh, in Neuchâtel, Neuchâtel in 1535, the, a landmark uh, French translation uh, based on original languages of the Bible. Um, and Calvin wrote a preface to this, uh, to this Bible. In fact, it was a Latin preface, and so it had a very short-lived impact on vernacular Bible reading. Um, and so eventually he would write a French preface. Um, in 1543, he wrote his first French preface that gives you really the first insight into his, the content of his theology. Um, but in 1546, he writes a new preface, um, that was an important year in French Bible history because that was the year that Calvin provided the first revision of the entire French Bible. And so that's the one I want to focus on. Um, his analysis begins with a focus on the nature and purpose of Scripture. And this is going to, to drive home this idea that the restoration of the gospel is what is motivating um, this expansion of vernacular Bibles. Um, through metaphor after metaphor, he unpacks that explanation. His primary purpose is to emphasize the way in which Holy Scripture is a treasure of inestimable benefit to the believer. It is a key that unlocks the kingdom of God. 
Through scripture, humanity comes to understand who God is and his expectations for human life. Scripture is a true guide that paves the path, which protects the believer from wandering and from error. It provides the true rule that enables the believer to discern between right and wrong. Scripture is a light or a lamp that shines in the midst of darkness and prevents believers from stumbling in the dark blindly. To Calvin, Scripture is a school of all wisdom and a wisdom that surpasses human understanding. And so he describes Scripture as a mirror by which humanity can contemplate the, faith of, the face of God and be transformed by his glory. Scripture is also for Calvin a royal scepter by which God governs us as his people. It is a shepherd's crook given for teaching. It's an instrument of God's alliance, so covenant with his people, by which he obliges himself to humanity according to his nature, um, a eternal bond. Scripture is a testimony of his goodwill that grants rest to our consciences, since by it we know where our salvation lies. Scripture is the unique pasture of our souls where we find nourishment that brings eternal life. To Calvin, Christianity is an assured religion because it is founded in Holy Scripture, and he describes it as an infallible truth of God. Um, having described the nature, he's going to encourage all people to participate in the gift that God gives to all people. Um, he makes a point to stress that, the need for access to scripture. Um, the, uh, secondly, Calvin is concerned with teaching how to read scripture. He stresses the reader requires orientation in order to profit from scripture. So this is interesting, too, because the pieces of the Bible often provide lots of interpretive guidance for the, the individual's encounter with the biblical text and then what they draw from the biblical text text as well. He talks about orienting and humility before you engage with scripture and in prayerfulness. Um, and a faithful reader thus possesses a pure and right zeal to seek God's will first and foremost with the expectation that you will then conform in your life, in your work, in your thought, in your speech. Um, and he focuses on the heart, that the heart will be purged of all concerns and affections of the flesh so that the meditation on spiritual matters can bear fruit. After exhorting the reader in this way extensively, Calvin acknowledges that every inclination of human nature is repug repugnant to these very instructions. For this reason, above all, a good reader must rely upon the work of the Holy Spirit, who is, he says, a good leader, who refuses none who calls upon him. This is the way to dispose oneself to the full benefits of Scripture. And so in the end, scripture is useful insofar as it instructs in good doctrine and consoles and exhorts and renders us perfect in every good work. And so um, by this approach and from this understanding, the reader learns to invest their trust in God through Christ, um, through the scriptural uh, testimony. And because the preface is also an opportunity to explain to the reader why a new translation is, is necessary, Luther's going to talk about, I'm sorry, Calvin's going to talk about how a new translation was needed for improvement, um, and, and mostly this is because the French language is, is developing so rapidly that uh, Pierre Olivetan's Bible is already out of fashion um, linguistically. So in comparing Calvin's preface, then, we jump to 1588. Theodore Beza, Calvin's successor and colleague, um, writes a preface to the Bible. And I think it's really interesting to see these two prefaces side by side. Um, the, immediately, um, you'll recognize that the, the context has shifted from Calvin's time. Beza, by 1588, is grappling with the increased competition of book markets and the need to distinguish between faithful translations. So it's, we are so effective at getting vernacular Bibles out there. Now there's so many projects of vernacular Bibles. How does a reader decide which Bible to read? 
Additionally, rather than critiquing those in the church who would prevent commoners um, from reading scripture, Beza is grieving the failure of various types of people who do not take advantage of the vernacular Bible available to them. He describes those groups as idle, and in some cases, an ignorant in others. They don't rightly seek the treasure of scripture. And yet even here, Beza is echoing the words of Calvin, holding readers to the same standard that Calvin first set out in his 1546 preface. And with some striking similarity too, Beza, Beza writes, their eyes, instead of being clear with the light that shines there, are blinded and their affections are not changed and amended, but are strengthened and worsened. So consequently, Beza stressed that the task of the church to provide scripture is not done nor is the transmission of scripture a new command. And so the Francophone world received the 1588 French Geneva Bible. So, and here then is an example of how the advancement of the vernacular Bible unfolded. So how should we commemorate and understand the importance of, the, of Luther's achievement? I think by promoting the primacy of scripture and enabling um, greater access and engagement with the text through his vernacular Bible and certainly aided by the printing press, Luther sought to address a spiritual need within the church that all people should have the encounter to have the opportunity to encounter the gospel message. And this is also undergirded by his view of the priest of all believers. His contribution would open the door, I think, for a culture increasingly engaged with the vernacular Bible. And this is also supported by education in schools and in churches. And the Bible prophecies of French Bibles illustrate that transformation for us as more and more vernacular Bibles entered the market. And yet, even with this, it's not about numbers, and it's not about propping up sacred book, but it's at trying to get at the heart of communicating the gospel message. Um, the reform, for the reformers, the dead bones could never take the place of the living word. And as Luther would declare, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Thank you. Thank you.